Okay, so thank you for joining us for Illinois Nutrient Loss Reduction Strategy Report with our speakers, Eliana Brown, Lane Kanoki, and Rachel Curry. Eliana, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Garrett. Excuse me. Thank you, Erin. I said your last name. Thank you, Erin Garrett. All right. Well, hey, welcome everyone. I'm Eliana Brown, Water Quality Specialist with Illinois Extension and Illinois, and, and Illinois Indiana Sea Grant. Welcome to today's Everyday Environment webinar about the Illinois Nutrient Loss Reduction Strategy and the 2021 Biennial Report. This event has been certified as a green event by the university's Institute for Sustainability, Energy and Environment, in line with the university's Illinois Climate Action Plan, or ICAP, prioritizing sustainability. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge our partners. So next slide, please. Thank you. The Illinois EPA and the Illinois Department of Agriculture. My co-speakers and I have Illinois EPA grants that fund our work. Speaking of my co-speakers, I will introduce them. Lane Kenoki is an outreach associate who works with me in my office based in Urbana, designated by the star on the map. Rachel Curry is a watershed outreach associate based in Galva and works in the Northern Priority watersheds depicted in blue on the map. So we will be turning off our cameras during this webinar to help with bandwidth. But here are today's key topics. Rachel will give an overview of the Illinois strategy, Gulf hypoxia and framework. I'll talk about the science assessment, work groups, and approach. Then we'll cover implementation with Rachel on agriculture and Lane on point source and stormwater. Finally, I'll close this out with adaptive management. We do have a lot of, infor a lot of information to present. The report is 210 pages long. So if we run out of time for questions, we'll provide our contact information at the end. So now I will hand it over to Rachel. It always helps if you unmute. Well, thank you, Eliana. Um, so let's see. Let, let me. Rachel, click on it two times. For some reason, it's not letting me advance. Uh, just tell me when to uh, to advance slides then. All right, if you want to go ahead and go to the next slide, please. All right, so again, thank you, Eliana. And before we start, I think it's important to get a better understanding of what exactly is hypoxia. So hypoxia in the Gulf of Mexico is a result of freshwater discharge and nutrient loading of the Mississippi River. Algae are going to feed on these nutrients, which result in algal blooms. And as the algae die, they decompose and use up a large amount of oxygen. And that creates a hypoxic zone. So regions within the hypoxic zone that contain less than two milligrams per liter of oxygen are uninhabitable. So anything that cannot leave the area actually suffocates. The hypoxic zone also has large implications for the fishing and tourism industries in the Gulf states, but algal blooms aren't just an issue for the Gulf of Mexico. Algal blooms also occur on our local water bodies and impact Illinois recreation and drinking water safety. Next slide, please. So annually, NOAA takes a boat out to measure the size of the hypoxic zone, and this graph shows the results. The dash line across the bottom is the hypoxia task force goal, and the dash line at the top is the five-year running average. The hypoxic zone is dynamic, and there are several factors that play into the size, including precipitation and other weather events such as hurricanes. Mm -hmm. In 2021, the hypoxic zone was larger than average and almost three times larger than the 20. 35 target that's been set by the hypoxia task force. Next slide, please. So speaking of the Gulf hypoxia task force, um, they published an action plan in 2008, 
which included reducing the size of the hypoxic zone to 1,930 square miles and reducing the nutrient load to the Gulf of Mexico. The plan was amended in 2015 to set nutrient load reductions of 20% by the year 2025 and 45% reduction by 2035. Next slide, please. So the Gulf of Mexico Hypoxia Task Force decided that states should take the lead on deciding their goals and how best to meet their goals. The US EPA sent a memo to the states um, that were tasked with creating the nutrient loss reduction strategies in 2011, and it included several elements that need to be included in their NLRS. And the elements include prioritizing watershed for nitrogen and phosphorus loading reductions, setting priority load or setting watershed load reduction goals based on the best available information, ensuring effectiveness of point source permits and priority sub watersheds, focusing on agricultural areas, stormwater or non MS4 and septic systems, accountability and verification measures, annual reporting of implementation and biannual report of load reduction, and to develop a plan and schedule for numeric nutrient criteria development. Next slide, please. So the Illinois EPA, the Illinois Department of Ag, and the University of Illinois, as well as other groups collaborated to produce the Illinois Nutrient Loss Reduction Strategy, which was first released in July of 2015. And the collaboration that I just mentioned is one aspect that makes the Illinois NLRS so unique. Next slide, please. The Illinois NLRS established a goal of a 45% reduction of nitrogen and phosphorus, which echoes the goals that were outlined by the Gulf Hypoxia Task Force. The interim goals or milestones are slightly different than um, where the Illinois goal is to reduce phosphorus loads by 25% and nitrogen loads by 15% by the year 2025. Next slide, please. So the Illinois NLRS addresses nutrient loads from agricultural non-point sources, point sources like wastewater treatment facilities, as well as urban stormwater. Next slide. So total nitrogen, nitrate nitrogen, and total phosphorus are broken down by their sources. Green represents the agricultural sources, blue represents urban runoff, and the red represents point sources. An example of a point source, again, is a muni mun municipal wastewater treatment plant. And as you can see, most of the nitrogen getting into our watersheds comes from agriculture, whereas phosphorus is split evenly between point sources and agriculture. And keep in mind that these graphs represent the state as a whole and not an individual area. And it's also important to note that um, with the NLRS, they're looking at all of the sources of nutrients, not just agriculture. Next slide, please. These graphs are to give you some idea of where we started and where we need to go. The graph scale is in millions of pounds per acre and the baseline urban runoff accounts for about 6 million pounds. Point, source, point sources account for 75.2 million pounds and agriculture accounts for almost 330 million pounds for a total of 410 million pounds of nitrate nitrogen per year. Where with the 45% reduction, the urban runoff will account for 3.25 million pounds, point source will account for 40.75 million pounds, and agriculture will account for 178 million pounds for a total of 222 million pounds per year. Phosphorus is slightly different, um, the baseline urban runoff accounted for about 1.5 million pounds, point sources were about 18 million pounds, and agriculture accounted for another 18 million pounds for a total of 37.5 million pounds of phosphorus per year. With the 45% reduction, urban runoff will account for 0.75 million pounds, point sources will be around 9 million pounds, and agriculture will be a little bit below 9 million pounds per year for a total of 18.75 million pounds per year. Next slide, please.
One of the elements of the NLRS was to identify priority watersheds, and Eliana pointed those out earlier. The map highlights the identified priority watersheds, where the blue watersheds are non-point nitrogen priority watersheds, orange are non-point phosphorus watersheds, and the angled lines are point source nitrogen and phosphorus priority watersheds. And there's a few of the watersheds that are outlined in red, and those are keep it for the crop watersheds, which were in place before the strategy. The watersheds were prioritized based on total loads, local water quality concerns, and active watershed plans. Next slide, please. So in 2015, the NLRS developed several different scenarios that were proposed, but only NP2 and NP3 would actually get us to our 45% reduction goal. And keep in mind that these are just examples of possible scenarios. Other elements of the NLRS, um, or another element of the NLRS was to be able to track implementation, which can be slightly challenging to do. With tracking in mind, two new scenarios were developed and included in the most recent biannual report, which Eliana will cover a little bit later. Next slide. Thank you. So there are different types of practices that can be recommended and implemented for agriculture. There are infield practices, edge of field practices, and land use change. Examples of infield practices for nitrate loss include nitrogen management, which could include MRTN or the maximum return to nitrogen ratio, nitrogen inhibitors, and split applications of your fertilizer, whether that's fall and spring or pre-plant and post-plant and side dress, as well as cover crops. And field practices for phosphorus loss include moving to reduce till, which can be no-till or strip-till, nutrient management, so taking soil tests and following the recommendations from those soil tests, as well as cover crops. Edge of field practices include wood chip bioreactors, stream buffers, and constructed wetlands. And land use change, or land use change would include taking land out of continuous row crop production and moving it to a perennial crop, whether that's CRP or an energy crop. With the 2021 biennial report, two new practices have been added, saturated buffers and terraces. Now it's important to remember that the implementation of agricultural conservation practices at this point in time is 100% voluntary. Next slide, please. So. Urban stormwater recommendations include MS4 permits, prioritizing green infrastructure and permeable surfaces along with providing technical and financial assistance, urban stream bank stabilization and restoration, as well as encouraging stormwater collaboratives. Next slide, please. Point source recommendations include NPDES permits, which are administered by the Illinois EPA. NPDES permits limit total phosphorus limits for major wastewater treatment facilities and include feasibility and optimization studies for nutrient removal. The Nutrient Assessment Reduction Plans, or NARPs, are new to the biennial report. The NLRS encourages urban watershed planning groups. And now I'm going to hand it back over to Eliana to, to discuss how the committee structure is set up. Thank you, Rachel. All right, whoops. All right, there we are. So the NLRS has approximately 60 stakeholders that serve on our working groups. The policy working group is the main working group that advises the process. Additional working groups include a communications subgroup, an agricultural water quality partnership forum and technical subgroup, urban stormwater working group with an education and tracking subgroup, performance benchmark working group, nutrient monitoring council, and a nutrient science advisory committee. The nutrient science advisory committee has completed its objective and no longer meets. 
Now shown here on this slide are the participants collaborating to form the Illinois NLRS Policy Working Group. And as you can see, there is a very wide variety of contributing organizations. The biennial report is another element of the nutrient loss strategy. The most recent report was released September 16th of 2021, and it's available on the Illinois EPA's website at go.illinois.edu slash NLRS. We're gonna talk a little bit more about this report. The biennial report is structured with these tracking measures. It reports data associated with the implementation of these tracking measures shown here in this logic model. Illinois' logic model is based off of Iowa's nutrient strategy model. So if we go from left to right, resources represents funding and staff. Outreach includes conferences and field days. Land and facilities represents agricultural conservation practice implementation, point source feasibility studies, and stormwater green infrastructure installations. And then lastly is the water measure. That includes the calculated statewide nutrient loads and five-year averages. The biennial report presents data on these tracking measures for those three source sectors that Rachel showed us on a slide a few slides back, agriculture, point source, and urban stormwater. I mentioned earlier that the 2021 biennial report was released September 16th. The report covers these reporting years of 2019 to 2020. Within that report, there is an executive summary, an introduction, a science assessment update, and then chapters on implementation for agriculture, point source, and stormwater, a working group accomplishments chapter, and an adaptive management chapter. We are going to summarize chapters three through six and eight during this webinar. So with the science assessment update, this is an update. Our original strategy that was released in 2015 included a peer reviewed science assessment that was written by University of Illinois researchers. And this highlights a point that we'd like to make. The nutrient loss reduction strategy is science-based. Now, each of these biennial reports have featured updates to that original science assessment. And uh, those updates include the most recent data available. This includes a measure of the amount of nutrients leave, leaving the state of Illinois. So the map on the right shows the eight major river systems in Illinois that provide data for the statewide nutrient loads. I, in this slide, I also just want to point out on the top right hand corner, there's a little logo on there that says water. That indicates that that's one of those water measures that I presented earlier. Not too important for understanding this, but maybe will help uh, help navigate things a little bit more. Now, the graphic on the left shows the five year average river flow and loads for 2015 to 2019. If I can use my cursor on here, make it a little bit so I can kind of highlight it as I'm talking about it. This navy blue line here, that's baseline. That was 1980 to 1996, and that's what we counted as our baseline. The arrows here are our interim and final reduction goals. Interim is 15% reduction for nitrogen and 25% reduction goal for phosphorus. And this, the, the, the final overall reduction goal is this 45%. So this is the direction that we want to be going. And unfortunately, we are going in this direction. We are seeing increases in nutrient loss rather than decreases. Now, part of this increase may be due to the increase in water flow that we also see here that's represented by our river flow. But there also is a need to have more practices implemented. And that brings me to my next slide. Rachel talked about the implementation scenarios 
that were in the original strategy. This 2021 biennial report included additional scenarios that better align with practices that we have more tracking information about. So one of these new scenarios, the one that's shown on the left, focuses on our interim goals, that 15 and 25% reduction. On here, we have our 2011 baseline implementation inf information from a NAS survey, and that's shown as these green bars, okay? Now these gray bars, is, so that would be the, the whole bar, that whole bar represents where we need to be to reach those interim goals. The graph on the right has that same kind of schematic, but it is looking at that 45% reduction goal scenario. Now, Rachel talked earlier about recommended practices. The 2021 report also included information about two new conservation practices that have been added to a list of recommended conservation practices. The science team at the University of Illinois developed a process for adding new practices or updating practice performance. The two, pra two practices that have been added are saturated buffers and terraces. You can see their associated reduction rates. The science assessment also includes information about the USGS continuous loading network. This map here on the left, right over here, shows the location of these USGS super gauges that are used to continuously monitor for nitrogen and phosphorus. The Illinois EPA uses the super gauge data along with their data to calculate annual loads and five-year averages. Now use that term super gauges. A little bit more about super gauges. These gauges measure multiple parameters about every 15 minutes. The gauges are measuring stream flow, nitrate, orthophosphate, turbidity, temperature, specific conductance, dissolved oxygen, and pH. Our next slide is a summary slide summarizing that uh, science assessment update. So our river flow, nitrogen, and phosphorus averages were up during the 2015 to 19 over the baseline by 25, 13, and 35 percent respectively. If we look just at point sources, the 2019 estimates for total phosphorus and total nitrogen were 18% and 1.7% lower than in 2011. And in 2020, it was 16 and 4.7% lower respectively. And Lane is gonna talk more about this when he covers the point source chapter. Now looking a little deeper, values were similar to in the past, except for these exceptions noted here. Phosphorus reductions in Chicago and Des Plaines, Phosphorus increases in the upper Sangamon and elsewhere. Changes in nitrogen load were correlated with changes in water flow for watersheds with high nitrogen yields. And nitrogen reductions per unit of water yield in the Mackinac Spoon, Kaskaskia, and Henderson Creek. Okay. Now I'm going to hand it back to Rachel to discuss the agricultural sector. Thank you. Would you mind? Next slide. Um, so switching gears, we're going to talk about implementation and we'll start with the agricultural sector followed by the point source and urban stormwater. So one of the exciting things about the partnership approach is that everyone is working towards common goals. We talked earlier about the logic model that started with resources and outreach. And as you can see, these tabs on the right-hand portion of the slide, the NLRS partners send us information that is then summarized on the screen. And I'll point out a few of the things. So the Ag Partner reported $11 million in funding invested in 2019, nearly $14 million in 2020. For outreach in 2019 and 2020, there were more than 1,000 outreach events that focused on the nutrient loss and reached over 72,000 attendees. Next slide, please. Um, 
Okay. The survey is based on the 2019 cropping year and was sent out to farmers across the state. The survey was used to gauge farmers' knowledge of the nutrient of nutrient loss and recommended conservation practices implement and their implementation level. The survey was used to help estimate implementation level of conservation practices with or without enrollment in state or federal cost share programs. The 2020 survey was the third time that the survey has been conducted. Next slide, please. Um, so the survey revealed that the farmer's knowledge or most knowledgeable regarding cover crops and the use of MRTN for determining nitrogen fertilizer rates. The survey also revealed that 43% of the farmers reported to be somewhat to very knowledgeable about the NLRS. The areas for future focus should include edge of field practices such as bioreactors and constructed wetlands. Next slide, please. So many producers are using some type of professional recommendations as they decide how much nitrogen to apply to their corn acres. The results from the most recent NAS survey, MRTN was used to determine the nitrogen rate on about a third of the planted corn acres. Producers used other industry recommended techniques on about 70% of their acres. Now it's important to note that farmers may consider more than one strategy before determining their nitrogen application strategy. So that's why the total percentage is greater than 100. Next slide, please. So the tables on this slide reflect the NAS survey questioning or questions regarding nitrification inhibitors. In 2019, nitrogen inhibitors were used with fall or winter nitrogen fertilizer applications on 14% of the planted acres and tiled acres and 5% of the non-tiled acres. So nitrification inhibitors were also used for spring fertilizer applications. The NAS survey indicated that nitrogen inhibitors were used on about 20%, 21% of the tiled acres and 20% of the non-tiled acres. Next slide, please. So the NAS survey asked farmers which NLRS recommended strategy they used, if any, to prepare for the 2019 corn crop on their tiled acres. It was determined that 3% of the total planted acres applied 50% or less of their total nitrogen in the fall or winter. 16% of the total planted acres had all of their spring nitrogen fertilizer applications, and 18% of the total acres had split their nitrogen fertilizer applications that included fall and spring applications. Next slide, please. And so the same question was asked regarding non-tiled acres. And it was determined that 1% of the total planted applied 50% or less of their total nitrogen in the fall or winter. 9% of the total planted acres had spring nitrogen fertilizer applications. And 7% of the total acres had split nitrogen fertilizer applications that included fall and spring applications. Next slide, please. In the survey, farmers were asked about their use of cover crops on both tiled and non-tiled acres of corn and soybeans. The survey results showed that farmers seeded 930,000 acres of cover crops on tiled ground and 480,000 on non-tiled ground for a total of 1.41 million acres across the state. Next slide, please. This slide is some of the available cost share programs that are available at the state and federal level. The USDA FSA offers CRP. Um, the USDA NRCS has EQIP, 
the Conservation Stewardship Program and Wetland Reserve Easement Programs. The Illinois Department of Ag has Partners for Conservation and the Cover Crops Premium Discount Program or the Fall Cover for Spring Savings. The Illinois EPA has a 319 grant program and the Illinois DNR has the Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program. Next slide, please. The USDA Farm Service Agency, or FSA, administers the CRP in Illinois. As many of you are aware, the CRP program is voluntary and assists participants in conserving and improving natural resources. Federal funds are used to provide incentives when applicable, cost share and annual rental payments in exchange for establishing and maintaining grass, wetland and tree-based practices over a 10 to 15 year contract. The CRP program is funded through FSA but is supported by the NRCS with assistance from the county soil and water conservation districts. In 2018, the CRP wetlands and buffers have remained relatively constant, while the number of acres enrolled in CRP perennial energy and pasture have increased more than half a million acres from 2018 to 2019, with a slight decrease in 2020. The, in 2020, there were more than 1 million acres of CERT that were certified as forage, grazing, or left standing, and over a half a million acres were enrolled in perennial vegetation practices. Cover crops are not a part of CRP or of the CRP program, and so the acres were voluntarily reported and represent cover crops planted regardless of financial assistance. Cover crop acres saw a dramatic increase in 2019, which may be due to a the large amount of prevent plant acres that were planted in response to the widespread flooding during this during that spring. Next slide, please. In Illinois, the USDA and RCS administers multiple programs such as EQIP and CSP. These programs address multiple natural resource concerns, including nutrient loss and wetland restoration protection and enhancement. These are voluntary conservation programs that support producers making conservation work for them by investing in proven conservation practices that safeguard natural resources while enhancing their agricultural operations. The Environmental Quality Incentives Program, or EQIP, provides financial and technical assistance to agricultural producers to address natural resource concerns and deliver on environmental benefits like improved water and air quality or increased soil health. In the federal fiscal years of 2019 and 2020, NRCS had 835 new EQIP contracts to implement conservation practices on almost 82,000 acres and represents an investment of over $28 million. The table and figures show the number of acres and dollars on nutrient conservation practices implemented through EQIP. The Conservation Stewardship Program, or CSP, provides financial and technical assistance to farmers for maintaining and improving existing conservation systems, as well as adopting additional conservation practices. Participants earn payments for conservation practices, so the higher the performance, the higher the payment. And the table and figure show the acres enrolled in CSP over the last 10 years. Next slide, please. The Wetland Reserve Easement Program uh, is a component of the Agriculture Conservation Easement Program. The Wetland Reserve Easement Program is another voluntary program, which is through the NRCS, um, and they sign agreements with eligible partners to leverage resources to carry out high priority wetland protection, restoration and enhancement, and to improve wildlife habitat. Unlike other conservation practices, wetlands are neither seasonal nor annual contract based. So acres that are enrolled in this program in the past remain in this program. Sorry, and so this figure and graph show the new acres that were added 
to the program annually, as well as cumulatively. So cumulatively, almost 11,500 acres have been enrolled in this program since 2011. Next slide, please. The Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program, or CREP, is a program that is administered through the Illinois DNR. CREP is a targeted federal and state incentive program that couples enhanced CRP incentives and payments with state payments. Again, participation is completely voluntary and is more financially rewarding than other CRP options. CREP is currently offered in the Illinois River and Kaskaskia River basins. There are several of the CREP goals that align with the goals of the NLRS, such as reducing nitrogen loading to the Mississippi River and Gulf of Mexico. Conservation practices that are under the federal CRP contract are not considered for the CREP or CREP program until the CRP contract expires. This table and figure on the slide show the number of acres with the um, with Illinois CREP easements. And you may notice that the acres in CREP have remained fairly constant since 2016. Now this is due to the lack of a state budget for fiscal years 2016 and 2017. So Illinois was unable to offer funding under CREP. So the CREP enrollment was suspended. Recently, funding for the state on the state side of CREP has been restored. And so, um, there's been revisions to the memorandum of the agreement between all the parties, and it has led to hope that the CREP enrollment may again begin here in the near future. Next slide, please. Partners for Conservation, or PFC, encourages increased nutrient management, conservation tillage, and implementation of cover crops into the crop management regime to slow erosion, improve soil health, enhance water infiltration, smother weeds, control pests and disease, and increase biodiversity. In 2019, PFC targeted $2.89 million, and in 2020, $2.4 million in allocation statewide for implementation. Combined PFC resources from 2019 and 2020 covered approximately 56% of the conservation adoption costs with the balance paid off by the applicants or landowners. Eligible conservation practices include terraces, grass waterways, water and sediment control basins or WASCOBs, grade stabilization structures, crop residue management, cover crops and nutrient management plans. From 2019 to 2020, landowners completed almost 2000 projects with the most common practice being cover crops. The table shows the breakdown of some of the PFC supported conservation practices by acres, cost share dollars, and cost to landowners. Next slide, please. Section 319 grant funds come from the Clean Water Act and are used to support the implementation of conservation practices that address non-point source pollution in rural and urban areas in Illinois. The Illinois EPA administers this program, which funds establishment and management of conservation tillage, cover crops, filter strips, wetlands, and other agricultural conservation practices, uh, specifically in watersheds with approved management plans, that address reducing nutrient loading into the Illinois waters. The table on this slide lists the number of acres treated by an agricultural conservation practice funded through Section 319 grant funds. In 2020, many of the approved grant funds were used for practices that are not currently rec recommended or tracked by the NLRS, which resulted in the lower number of acres. It is important to note that for all agricultural practices implemented using 319 grant funds, there were almost 4,700 pounds of nitrogen and 2,400 pounds of phosphorus that were reduced in 2019, and almost 2,400 pounds of total nitrogen and 1,400 pounds of total phosphorus reduced in 2020. Also keep in mind that many of these structures have a lifespan of between 10 and 20 years. So load reductions are realized annually during their lifespan. 
During 2011, Section 319 funding led to a reduction in nitrogen loads of over 70,000 pounds and phosphorus loads by almost 30,000 pounds, according to calculations that were done by the U.S. EPA Region 5 Load Estimation Spreadsheet. During the past two years, most of the nitrogen reductions have occurred through nutrient management plans, and most of the phosphorus reductions have occurred through the cover crops that were implemented in 2019. Next slide, please. Now we've talked a lot about different agricultural conservation practices that are supported by the NLRS with funding opportunities through state, local, and or non-governmental organizations like the Illinois Farm Bureau, the Illinois Corn Growers Association, and the Illinois Soybean Association. Agricultural conservation practices can be divided up into three types. There are infield practices, edge of field practices, or land use change. Infield practices include reduced tillage, cover crops, and nutrient management. Edge of field practices include practices such as the wood chip bioreactors, which is what the picture is of. And the land use change involves taking some of your less productive row crop ground and converting it to either perennial or energy crops. Now, the picture that I just mentioned was taken during the installation of a wood chip bioreactor. By the end of 2020, there are 42 wood chip bioreactors in Illinois that treat almost uh, 1,460 acres. If you are interested in learning more about any of these practices that are supported by the NLRS, please reach out to myself. You can also reach out to your local extension office and or your local soil and water conservation district. Next slide, please. Thank you. Now, I mentioned earlier about the non-governmental organizations that have programs and projects that are associated with the NLRS. The pictured partners are just some of the partners that have projects that are related to the strategy. And it's these partner programs that support the strategy and are what make it move forward. And it's important to note that we couldn't be successful without the partners. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Lane who will talk about the point source sector. Thanks, Rachel. All right, the point sources in this section focus mainly on municipal wastewater treatment plants. These plants run wastewater through a complex system of processes such as the one shown on this slide. They discharge treated water from a pipe considered a point to receiving streams. Their NPDES permit, regulated by the Illinois EPA, require monitoring and reporting. These items are included in the report. The report updates the nitrogen and phosphorus loads coming from municipal wastewater treatment plants and industrial facilities with 2019 and 2020 data. The reductions are compared to the 2011 baseline loads. Facilities provide information on a monthly basis. There are some facilities that are actually already meeting the average concentration goals listed here. Many facilities will have nutrient assessment and reduction plans, NARPs for short, due in 2023 or 2024. The report also tracks optimization and feasibility plans for reducing phosphorus loads. Finally, the report updates activities of watershed planning groups. Like the ag sector, we asked the point sector for information about investment and outreach. The Illinois Association of Wastewater Agencies, IAWA, compiled and provided this information. The first table shows point source outreach activities reported by IAWA with a total of 2,663 attendees. The second table shows funds expended towards nutrient loss reduction by the IAWA reporting numbers, members. In the 2019 to 2020 years, it was more than $250 million spent, and that was mostly on capital improvements to upgrade and add treatment capabilities. Biological phosphorus removal requires capital improvements 
And there are other expenses such as backup chemical phosphorus removal systems and staffing costs for optimization, pilots, research, et cetera. What you see here is only what was reported to us and we'd expect that the actual investments would be much higher. The next two slides, slides show the point source sector nutrient reductions for 2019 and 2020 that Eliana mentioned earlier on. The data are from monthly reports to the Illinois EPA. This slide is phosphorus reduction, which is the emphasis for point source plans and permits right now. As compared to the 2011 baseline, phosphorus reductions in 2019 and 2020 were 18% and 16% respectively. For nitrogen in 2019, it was 1.7% reduction. And in 2020, it was 4.7% reduction as compared to the 2011 baseline. These tables show the top 10 wastewater treatment facilities for total phosphorus removal. These include the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District of Greater Chicago Stickney Plant, which is not only the largest facility in the state, it's the largest in the nation. Given the scale, it's important for Stickney and the other facilities listed here to have actively pursued capital upgrades that remove phosphorus. We mentioned earlier that wastewater treatment facilities are under NPDES permits administered by the Illinois EPA. As part of these issued permits, 143 phosphorus uh, removal feasibility studies and 143 optimization studies have been submitted to the Illinois EPA by the end of 2020. And 36% of major municipal permits have phosphorus limits in place. Going further, the Illinois Association of Wastewater Agencies, the Illinois EPA, and a coalition of environmental groups have an agreement for facilities greater than 1 million gallons per day to develop nutrient assessment and reduction plans known as NARPs. To ensure phosphorus load reductions beyond 2025, a special condition will be included in all permits. A NARP is required if the facility is located upstream of a water body or stream segment that has been determined to have a phosphorus related impairment or if that facility is determined to be at risk of eutrophication due to phosphorus levels in the water body. Facilities will be required to meet 0.5 milligrams per liter total phosphorus, 12 month rolling geometric mean by January 1st, 2030. The NARP will be developed and submitted to the Illinois EPA by December 31st, 2023 or 2024 depending on when the permit was issued. It needs to be supported by data and sound scientific rationale. The permittee needs to cooperate with and work with other stakeholders in the watershed to, to determine the most cost-effective way to address phosphorus issues. To determine target levels, the NARP either uses recommendations developed by the Nutrient Science Advisory Committee or develops its own watershed-specific target levels. It needs to identify phosphorus input reductions from point sources and non-point sources and provide a schedule for implementation. And finally, the NARP may include provisions for water quality trading to address the phosphorus-related impairments in the watershed. And now we'll take a look at stormwater implementation. And just as a reminder to everyone, stormwater is rainfall and snow melt that flows off developed areas and it is a source of nutrients. While the 2015 science assessment determined that stormwater nutrient load is small compared to the other sectors, it can be important for local water quality. So Illinois does include it in our program. Implementation can be challenging to track. Uh, the data sources we used for the biennial report that I'll talk about today include stormwater sector partner uh, spreadsheets, information from Illinois EPA grants and MS4 report analysis. Like the other sector partners, stormwater partners provided information about resources and outreach. For resources, the first table shows funding reported by stormwater uh, sector partners at over $2.25 million in 2019 
and more than $1.8 million in 2020. Moving on to the second table, outreach, the partners reported 149 events with an attendance of 14,340 people despite the 2020 pandemic obstacles. I want to give uh, a special mention to the DuPage County uh, who were a great example of a successful online transition. The Illinois EPA provides information about the urban practices installed under the Section 319 program. Participation in and implementation of the grant program has varied from year to year. In the years 2011 to 2020, the cumulative total of urban practices installed through the program was at 103. MS4 stands for Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System. A community is considered an MS4 if they have a residential population of at least 50,000 people and an overall population density of at least 500 people per square mile. Illinois has 362 communities with active MS4 permits that are required to submit annual reports to the Illinois EPA. They're shown here on this map. These reports are narrative and take considerable time to read through, starting with the biennial report uh, that we published last year. Extension began, began a comprehensive review of these reports with the intent to better understand water quality and green infrastructure practice implementation. For this report, the analysis was expanded and we read and analyzed more than 500 MS4 reports for 2019 and 2020. Not surprisingly, some practices such as outreach and erosion control programs are almost universal because they're required as a condition of the permit. However, a majority of communities uh, also have implemented street sweeping and leaf collecting, both of which have been shown to reduce phosphorus loads lost to storm sewers. We're at 77% for street sweeping and 64% with leaf collection. I've showed you some information about the Illinois EPA 319 program uh, in the last slide. Illinois EPA also has a green infrastructure grant program that, uh, that was just started in 2020 and that supports practice implementation. We also looked at the MWR DGC uh, stormwater report, which showed a commitment to GI implementation, green infrastructure implementation. Finally, the report includes several uh, partner program updates listed on, the, uh, on that slide uh, that advanced stormwater in Illinois. And with that, I will hand it back over to Eliana for the remainder of the presentation. Thank you, Lane. Okay, I'm gonna bring us home with adaptive management. I can advance your slide. All right, there we go. Adaptive management is a means to advance nutrient loss reduction in Illinois. It allows the strategy to be a living document focused on both traditional and new technologies and practices. This section summarizes the current state of water quality in Illinois and outlines recommendations for future practice adjustments based on current data and emerging science and policy to achieve NLRS goals. Now these graphs shown on this slide are another way to show the information that I presented earlier that includes information for additional years. Uh, this shows the baseline. So this is our baseline year here in red for nitrogen and for phosphorus. And it also shows the five-year running averages for the total nitrate, nitrogen, and total phosphorus average annual loads in million pounds per year. The orange line here at the top is our interim goal, our interim goals, and the green lines are that 45% reduction. Now, unfortunately, the nitrate, nitrogen, and total phosphorus loads aren't showing a steady decrease. So part of this increase may be due to the increase in water flow that I already mentioned, but there is also a need for more practice implementation. So this next slide covers the implementation. These graphs show the current implementation of two of the scenarios that I talked about earlier that show agricultural practices. Earlier, I showed a 2011 levels that were in green. Now here on this slide, it's the orange bar is the current implementation level as of 2019. 
the Navy bar is the needed implementation to achieve the 45% uh, reduction goal. A, this kind of aqua blue tick mark is for our interim nitrogen and uh, this kind of uh, pinky purple mark is the interim phosphorus reduction levels. Now these are for the, uh, the new implementation scenarios. And uh, on the left is the interim nitrogen and phosphorus reduction goals. And on the right is that 45% reduction goal. Implementation level based on the NAS survey are those orange bars. And um, for, the, the, um, for the nitrogen and phosphorus reduction goals based on conservation practices. The graph on the right also shows the current implementation level, the 45 prediction, the 45% reduction goal and the interim nitrogen and phosphorus goals based on conservation practices. So it's just a little bit more updated information than um, that's showing our current level as of 2019 for implementation in the agricultural sector. For the, the point source sector, this is how we are representing implementation. As Lane mentioned, this sector is focusing on phosphorus reduction. During this reporting period, point sources reduced phosphorus loads by 16 to 18% compared to the 2011 baseline year. While the load reductions are substantial, they represent a decrease from those reported in our 2019 biennial report. Now in 2018, our nutrient load reductions had almost achieved the 2025 interim reduction goals for this point source sector. However, wastewater treatment plants are biological systems requiring complex management, which may have been a contributing factor in our 2019 to 2020 years. These decreases in load reductions are likely temporary and the point source sector remains on track to achieve nutrient loss reduction goals. The right-hand portion of the graph over here shows where things would be if all major facilities reduced to a discharge concentration of one milligram per liter. The sector would be far ahead of our long-term goal of the 45% reduction from the 2011 baseline. And then looking ahead, our two large metropolitan water reclamation district plants, the Calumet and the O'Brien plant will have a one milligram per liter permit limit kicking in soon. So that will be in 2024 and 2027, respectively. So moving forward, our policy working group and all of our other working groups and committees are continuing to meet. We have collaborations among agencies and organizations, and those are continued to be encouraged and supported. And we are promoting planning and implementation at the watershed scale. I'm gonna show on the next slide, we are just about at our two o'clock hour. And I know a lot of people that have come on here may be individuals. And the last time we gave this kind of presentation, we received feedback that it would be helpful to know what uh, an individual can do. And so we're covering that on this slide. If you happen to be a producer, uh, as Rachel mentioned, contact your local Farm Bureau, Extension Office, NRCS, Soil and Water Conservation District offices, Rachel herself. If you happen to be a homeowner, we did a webinar last year, improving water quality from the comfort of your home. And so we encourage you to watch that webinar. If you are a student or if you want to learn more, more about nutrient issues, we encourage you to see Nutrient Explorer, which is housed at the Illinois Indiana Sea Grant website. And thank you, Erin, for putting those links into the chat box. Okay, so we want to thank you for attending this webinar. We ask that you complete the evaluation of the webinar by scanning the QR code that you can see on the screen here. You can also 
visit the uh, website below, um, this goillinois.edu slash NLRS 2022 survey would get you to that evaluation. On the right-hand part, part of the screen, if you want to learn more about the nutrient strategy, go.illinois.edu slash NLRS will take you to the Illinois EPA's nutrient website. Um, very importantly, we encourage you to check out this excellent podcast that Rachel produces with Todd Gleason, the Illinois Nutrient Loss Reduction Podcast. And thank you so much, Erin, for putting these links into the chat box. Lastly, we have our social media. We are at Illinois NLRS and we're on Twitter and Facebook. If you happen to have questions for us, the, uh, our contact information is on this slide and Erin uh, has put that in the chat box as well. I can't end without a promotion for our next month webinar. It's the return of large predators with um, Enri educator Peggy Doty, and that is March 10th at 1 p.m. You can register at go.illinois.edu slash return of large predators. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you so much, Eliana, Rachel, and Lane. And thank you everyone for joining us today. We hope to see you next month. Enjoy your afternoon.